All right, so we're in this text. Um, it's a narrative. We're back into the, uh, some of this narrative stuff. And uh, if you're not aware, the narrative that we're in and the narrative next week are probably the most well-known miracles. There's a difference. Jesus healing people. Now he's going to do some crazy things in, in the feeding of the uh, 5,000, the 4,000 later on. Uh, he's going to walk on water next week. So we're going to enter into kind of those famous narratives. And they're in all four Gospels, which is honestly not as common as you would think uh, for, for a passage to appear in all four Gospels. So that's what we've got uh, today. I'm going to explain why we don't have the first 12 for verses. If you've been tracking along, you've been pretty diligent in reading through the book of Matthew, why Gabby came up here and read. But I'm going to read verse 13. If you haven't been with us, big Bible study together. We're going to go through this thing verse by verse. I'm going to start in verse 13 and explain why we're not reading the first 12 verses. It says this, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. Okay, uh, if you grow up in a church long enough, or maybe you've just kind of been around, uh, sometimes this verse is really a catalyst verse to be used almost as self care. You should, as a believer, like Jesus, go and uh, you know go by yourself. And I am, of course, not against uh, getting uh, individual time with the Lord. I think that's part of it. Uh, I would just say that's not what this verse is saying. That's not the point of this verse. And we know that because the back half of verse thirteen is on the heels of the end of the middle of 13. Now, when Jesus heard, here's the key word, this, okay? So let me uh, paint a context which you might not be aware of of what's really going on here. The this is the first 12 verses of chapter 14 in Matthew. The this is something we actually covered months ago, okay? Uh, and the this is a story of John the Baptist. About a few months ago, we uh, ran into a passage of a guy that we were reintroduced to. We were introduced to him at the beginning of the, the Gospel of Matthew, He's the one who uh, baptized Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. He's the one who uh, uh, leapt in uh, Elizabeth's womb when they were close, when she was close to Mary. John the Baptist is a cousin of Jesus. And um, what we come to find out, we stopped in this moment where we wanted to spend an entire Sunday because Matthew keeps going back to John the Baptist. Uh, I looked ahead to chapter 14. If you're with us, you remember this. And I said, hey, there's going to be a moment where we get to chapter 14, the first 12 verses. We're not going to cover those verses. I'm going to cover them right now. And that's what we did a few months ago. Here's what happened. Okay, there's a Herod at the beginning of the, the Gospels that has all these babies murdered. You might be familiar with him. Uh, he has three sons. And in having these three sons, when that Herod passes away, those three sons take on their father's name, Herod, but Herod different. Herod Antipas, Herod the Tetrarch, Herod Philip. There's these different Herods. These three sons take over the land that that Herod was over. So the land that Herod was over that murdered all those, that evil man that murdered all those children. Well, he ends up separating and actually it ends up being separated afterwards. Jesus was probably about eight or nine years old at this time when he dies. The, the uh, land is separated to these three sons. And one of the sons got more land than the other two sons because he married a princess from a foreign land. And marrying that princess for the foreign land, the king of that land gave this land over to this other Herod, Herod Philip. Well, eventually this princess leaves that Herod to go be with another Herod, Herod the, uh, uh, um, oh, I'm getting all the Herods confused here, Herod Antipas, uh, leaves that Herod to go to this other Herod, who is his brother. Well, she had a child with that previous Herod. You guys tracking? No? That makes sense. Okay. So we're here where we are. So, so Leaves has a child, a, a daughter, and goes and bees with, uh, goes and bees with this other Herod. All right? It's a long soap opera. Civil war took place. There's a lot of things I'm not going into. Okay. Long story short, that Herod is uh, ruling over his kingdom, has his new wife, Herodias, and uh, she's sitting by his side. His now, what is his niece, comes out and does a dance. And in, in doing this dance, uh, he's, you know, and you can just use your imagination. Imagine here's this young girl, she's dancing, what's going through their mind. They've had a little bit too, bit too much liquor. And he says, hey, listen, you can have whatever you want in my kingdom. Just ask, ask for it. So uh, he, she, the, the girl, goes to her mom. Uh, the mom whispers in uh, her ear, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And that's exactly what happens. John the Baptist is killed, and that's the 12 verses. So it's really important that John the Baptist, who is very close to Jesus, is now killed. And then we get verse 13. Now I want you to imagine verse 13 is on the back end of the first 12 verses instead of the front end of our passage. How would you read verse 13 differently? You would read it differently, would you not? All of that happened now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. Can you see how the context changes suddenly? Jesus goes and mourns. I mean, and like, do the math real quick, you guys. If you don't know, uh, Zeke and Josh, 
uh, who were uh, leading worship for us with the team, uh, they're cousins, and they're pretty close cousins. I don't know if they're John the Baptist and Jesus close, but they're close. Um, now, just for a sermon illustration that I don't need to give you, ask Zeke um, what he would be going through if Josh was murdered. Or ask Josh what he would be going through if Zeke was murdered. I mean, honestly, like, you, you have somebody who not just was at Jesus' baptism, but baptized Jesus. How many birthday parties did they go to? I mean, for the love of everything, they literally knew each other inside the womb. I mean, how much closer can you get? And here Jesus loses this beloved, not just cousin, family member, but he loses this friend. And it's weird because if you're reading Matthew, there's almost a sense for a moment, and this sounds awkward, so give me grace in saying this, but we almost have compassion on Jesus. There's a sense of where like, there's a little bit of empathy or sympathy, like that's brutal. It feels like Hebrews 4 is coming alive. He really is a faithful high priest who's able to sympathize in our weakness. He knows, those of you in the room who've lost a brother, a mother, a son, a daughter, he knows what that's like. He knows what that's like. And this is the moment uh, that uh, sets the tone for us as we go into our passage. So Jesus uh, uh, isolates himself, goes away. That's kind of the whole story there. That is the this. Now he's isolated by himself. Now notice the next word is but. When the crowds, but, when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When they heard, not about John the Baptist, but when they heard that he uh, went by himself to a desolate place, the crowds see where Jesus goes and they follow him by foot to where he is. There's a part of me when I'm reading through Matthew, I try to read through the passage that we're going through on a Sunday, you know, 20, 30 times. And I, eventually I'm just going, leave the man alone. Like give him, give him a break, right? And so they're following him. And if you're wondering, you know, why are they following him? We actually get insight in the gospel of John after Jesus does the miracle we're about to read about, Jesus says, you're only following me because you ate. The crowds, in the most honest and vulnerable way possible, are following him for selfish reasons. They're going after him because they have a need. They're not going after him to glorify him or praise him. They have sickness, they have need, they're hungry, whatever it is. They see Jesus as in that moment, we get this beautiful display and act of grace, which if we can just at minimum acknowledge, this is much better than what we saw last week where Jesus was in a context where they didn't believe he could do anything. We have this crowd following um, where they believe he can do everything. Verse 14, okay? When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. So he sees the crowd and he had compassion on them and he healed they're sick. I think this is beautiful. And we got to pause for a second. We actually get amidst Jesus's brokenness, he has compassion. If I was to add an emphasis to almost maybe set the tone a little bit more, what if we added the emphasis of verse 14 like this? When he went ashore, he saw the crowds and he had compassion on them. I mean, we're reading the story and it's almost like Jesus is like in this moment of brokenness and yet out of the depths of nothing, out of the depths of sorrow, he has compassion on them. Now, some of you guys have heard this word before, which is used 12 times, uh, but maybe you haven't heard it articulated in, in a definite order. So let me read something to you from Amy Sherman in her book, Kingdom Calling, who I think gives a, a good definition of what's really going on when Jesus sees this crowd and why he ends, end up, ends up pressing into healing their sick. It says, the Greek word for felt compassion, now here's a fancy word, splagnizomai, okay? You don't have to memorize that word. It quite literally means to have the bowels yearn. And that's true, to have the bowels yearn with pity. It's like Nizomai refers to innards or guts. As Jesus looks out at the hungry crowds, his experience, or he experiences gut-wrenching compassion. This Greek word is used 12 times in the New Testament. 11 of them refer to Jesus being moved with compassion and then feeding or healing or teaching. Now, I want you to look at our passage in verse 14. I think ESV gets this wrong. When it says, and he had compassion, that's, I don't think that's a right way to translate it. Some of you guys have a different translation and it says what she brings up, he's moved with compassion. I think that's appropriate. In Greek, it's in the passive, meaning Jesus, it's not that he doesn't want to have compassion. He's hit with compassion. Okay, he's hit with compassion as he sees the crowd. And it is true, it's used um, uh, 12 times in the New Testament, 11 of which refer to Jesus. You wanna know the 12th time that it's used? The 12th time it's used, it's referring to a father who sees his son who's been acting a fool for a long time. He sees him from, from afar off and he runs towards him. Now we think of compassion like, oh, like I feel bad for you. That is not the word that is being used here. Uh, there is something about the mixing of a deep depth relationship. There's something about gut-wrenching, I don't want this to happen. I remember when my oldest daughter, she's nine now, she was two, 
and she got a little cut on her foot and we didn't think it was a big deal and her foot started to swell up. She got super lethargic. We took her to urgent care and they said, you need to get her to um, the emergency room right now. It's staff and it's, it's gonna go septic and she's gonna die, right? Which is always terrible to tell a parent. And for two days, I didn't eat because there's a sense of compassion and like I have compassion, but there's a sense that I feel something deep in my gut. I don't want this to be true. I don't, and, 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 and this is where honestly media tries to capture you giving to some organization or whatever it is. They wanna capture on the moment of showing the starving child. They want you to feel this, not just compassion, but gut-wrenching compassion. And this is what Jesus feels. He sees this crowd who is shepherdless, who is hungry, and he feels the nature of the moment. He feels this gut-wrenching compassion. His, his bowels are churning. He's, he's sorrowful. There's something deep going on than just, Oh, like these poor people, they're hungry. So we continue on with that idea, which can I just say is super congruent with the God of the Old Testament. Um, you know, Psalm 145 ends up saying that he has compassion over all that he makes. But let's go to verse 15. Now when, he, and now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, I think this is kind of funny, we're actually led to believe, which I think is true. He's been healing the sick all day. It's almost like in Zootopia when the rabbit spends time with the sloth. It's night. Like he's healing where I said, now it's nighttime. We're just left like, I've been doing this all day, okay? When it's evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. The day is now over. Send the crowds away to go to the villages and buy food for themselves. Verse 16, but Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. One of my great apologetics for uh, the disciples not changing the New Testament is stories like this. I feel like that's exactly how it answered Jesus in verse 17. Like, Jesus, this needs to happen. He's like, you do it. And I'm like, well, you see all of them, right? We have five pieces, like five loaves of bread. There's, no, there's a sense of the disciples going, what, what do you mean we feed them? We don't have the resources to feed them, which is, of course, brilliant. If you want to know, actually, the details of this interaction, Jesus is not talking to the disciples at broad. The Gospel of John says he's talking directly to Philip. And it's a sense of, I don't want to use the word test, but it's the sense of like, hey, like, I've been with you. You've seen what I've been able to do, and I want to use you in this moment. And it's an interaction between Jesus and Philip. So here's this crowd. Uh, 5,000 people, I'll contend that it's more here in a little bit. They're hungry, don't send them away, let's take care of them. That's, that's what our passage is putting in front of us, all right? That being said, verse 18, and Jesus said, bring them here to me. So bring the five loaves and the two fish here to me, which is probably barley loaves and, and pickled fish, that's how they would travel, so that's what he got. So bring them to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, so there's this grassy area, take the five loaves and two fish, and he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied. First and foremost, let me say this. I think there's a thousand different things going on in this passage that I'm gonna do my best to explain as many as of them as I can here in a second. But just focusing in on the text, I wanna um, enter into kind of how my mind works. And maybe if you've read this passage before, Awanas, VBS, you've just grown callous to it. So if we can kind of slow down, here's like the $100 question I want to know. And I, I, some of which it's funny, but I'm not saying it for comical purposes. But but I want to know at which point does the bread multiply, okay? Because there's two interactions. Look at that at the end of verse 19. So he, he prays for the bread, he breaks it, and then look at the two interactions. He gave the loaf to the disciples, there's one exchange, and the disciples gave the loaves to the crowds. So is it Jesus kind of with his Mary Poppins basket keep pulling out loaves, right? And then he hands it over to them and they're like, where do you keep getting these loaves? Or like they have this loaf of bread and they just keep chunking it off and they're like, yo, this bread is not going anywhere right now. I don't know, one day we'll know. Right now I have no idea. Regardless, we are led to believe this is a miracle. I mean, this is, this is crazy. And in the text, there's a few things going on that I, I, I think is, is pretty brilliant uh, in this whole thing. Number one, look at verse 20. They all ate and they were satisfied. Literally in Greek means they, were, they took their fill or they were fattened. Uh, the, the NLT says they ate as much as they wanted, okay? So it's not just like, hey, you guys got enough. They are full. They, they are full in eating this. The other thing that I want you to see, and it's, it's uh, not immediate, but that he, when Jesus placed them in crowds, it says that they're sitting down. They all sat down, sit down on the grass. You see that in the text? The word there in Greek is really cool. It's anaklino. If you say that word slow enough, you can actually hear what they're doing. Anaklino, it's where we get our word recline from. Okay, and I, here's why this is really brilliant uh, what Matthew is doing for us. He has taken this scene where um, it's, it's using language of a destitute place, this desolate place where people are gonna go hungry, uh, they're gonna go to bed hungry that night. So now there's this scene on this grassy hill next to this still water 
and they're just reclining. And as a matter of fact, in other writing, for example, in the Maccabees, which isn't canon outside of scripture, this word is used to be a moment of celebration. Some of you have been in this environments before. You've sat at dinner tables before where time is not an issue, right? Or you've had as much food and drink as you possibly can have and you felt like you laughed until your bellies hurt. That's what's going on right now. That this moment was destitute and this is just the beauty of Jesus. He absolutely changes the scene. Now it's this evening dinner with thousands of people sitting by the seaside. It's just beautiful. It's just that, that is what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. Uh, beyond all that, we get the uh, end of verse 20 and verse 21 to finish out our text. And they took up the 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. First and foremost, the end of 20. I know this has been brought up, brought up before. If you've heard anything on this text, it is, the, you know, it is noticing that there are 12 baskets brought. I, I know it's kind of cliche to say, but it is true that Jesus does provide for the providers. He uses his disciples to provide for these people. And he ends up providing 12 baskets left, which is clearly more than they originally had. He provides for the providers, which is a very Jesus thing to do. And then the other half, that, that last statement there is the reason uh, my articulation would be it's more than 5,000 men because it says it, verse 21. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Some would say up to 20,000 people were there. Some at minimum, the lowest I heard was at least 8,000. So we'll call it an easy 10. I mean, imagine you've got five loaves, two fish to feed 10,000 people. And, and honestly, that's not even saying how much teenagers eat. And the reality is some of you homies I take to lunch in college, I'm like, well, the church is broke now. Congratulations, okay? So, so like what, what we have here is this moment where Jesus is, he's, he's amazing. I mean, I, I, we kind of stand back. He has changed the molecular structure of bread and fish to feed at minimum 5,000 men, okay? That's our story. So, with that being the case, this miracle that has grown pretty rote for some of you, for just being honest, I mean, uh, we get fascinated to look at um, uh, you know, professional athletes, whether it be in golf or, or uh, basketball or whatever. We watch them and we're not that amazed with some of the things that they do. I mean, you can watch past highlights of Jordan and go, that's pretty crazy, but you're so used to Jordan doing amazing things that it's not that amazing anymore. And that's the unfortunate nature of this text. We've just watched Jesus do amazing thing after amazing thing after amazing thing. Think how legit you have to be when you feed 5,000 people with five five loaves of bread and the people watching it go, I don't know, that's pretty normal. Think of how amazing you have to be. And so I want to kind of stand back and just acknowledge what's going on and what is our role in hearing this text? Why would the Spirit give us this text and what are we supposed to do with it? Okay, that being said, let, let's uh, start to move in that direction. Here's the first thing that I would say. When we read this text, I think first and foremost, as an umbrella of everything else we could talk about, we are to walk away and see Jesus as a bad man. He is the real deal. And I don't mean just in feeding 5,000 people, though that's true. Look at his leadership ability. Here's what's going on. You take care of this. He puts them in groups. I mean, that's all amazing. But there's a passage. The passage that I read from uh, John earlier about the crowds, the reason that they followed him is because they wanted to eat. Let me read the rest of that passage. It says this uh, in the NLT. It says, I tell you the truth. Uh, you want to be with me because I fed you. And now listen to this. He says, not because you understood the miraculous signs. So we read the feeding of the 5,000, but Jesus is going, you're only reading the fact that I fed the 5,000, you were filled, but actually this is a miraculous sign. There's so many other things going on. Let me give you an example. One is in Psalm 23. One of the commentaries I'm using for this is by a guy named John Del Husse, who's one of my favorite theologians. I think he's brilliant. He's a local guy here. And just spending time with him, he is uh, adamant that when we read the feeding of the 5,000 in this moment with green pastures beside still waters, and I quote, it's exactly what it is, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He's going, Jesus is fulfilling Psalm 23. I mean, here's this moment where they're sitting in this grass. And, and I know I'm doing the work for us right now. I get that. But no Jew has, doesn't, they don't need me to do the work. They're seeing that. They're seeing this language. It's not an accident. Matthew is what? He's an evangelist to the Jews. We said that from day one over a year ago as we entered into Matthew. Uh, we're going through this story and he constantly is giving these nods to the Old Testament. Let me tell you another encounter. In uh, Exodus chapter 16, there's another moment where there's a group of people hungry. Is there not? And what happens? A miraculous feeding of manna. And so we read the story, we go, ah, no, no, these are nods. And maybe one that you're not familiar, as familiar with. In 2 Kings, there's a man named Elijah who has 20 loaves of bread and he only has 100 men. Now, you might be able to fill, uh, maybe, I don't know about fill, at least satisfy 100 men with 20 loaves of bread. That's about five uh, men per loaf of bread. I think if we were to take five grown men here, would we be filled up? I mean, if it's bulk season, maybe uh, not. But like the reality is like that's, that's, 
is, but I think what's happening here is Jesus not just reenacts this uh, moment, but he accelerates it. He, he makes it even bigger. I mean, just do the math. If it's 10,000 people, you're talking 2,000 people per loaf of bread. That's crazy. And so he's the better Elijah. He's the better Moses. We've talked about this, haven't we? He is the great shepherd. Jesus, in all real time, you've come to me for food, but you don't understand the miraculous sign he's putting in front of him. He's putting in front of him. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the prophecies, it's either Micah or Malachi, I should know, but it says that after the exile, the Messiah will come and feast with his people. We just see this echoing and echoing and echoing. And so the umbrella that we have to walk away with is go, Jesus is the man. He is the man. It is hard not to read this story and just go, he's the real deal. Even if you're an atheist here, our worldview, at least have to acknowledge that our worldview, we, have, we give credence based on this book to go, Jesus is a big deal. And we walk away from the story and go, he deserves some glory in this. Now, that's the umbrella, okay? Underneath that umbrella, I think there are two things walking away that is helpful for us. Number one, I think we are the crowd. And number two, I think we're the disciples. So here's what I mean by that. It's really important that you don't let the prosperity gospel steal this biblical truth from you. Jesus did not provide then, but Jesus still does provide. He still does provide. And you've allowed, like, it's weird in the Reformed community, we almost don't know how to operate with this idea. God is still working. Uh, Richard um, did our devotional yesterday uh, for the elders meeting. At our elders meeting, we always have somebody open up with a devotional. And he did a devotional on, uh, the, in the Gospel of Mark, the encounter where two disciples come to Jesus and say, we have a request. And his uh, um, uh, call back to them is, uh, what is it that you want me to do for you? What is it that you want me to do? That's what he, Jesus says to the two disciples. Well, in the next story, you have a blind man. And he says, Jesus, Jesus. He's calling out. They're all like, no, shut up, stop talking. Jesus, Jesus. And Jesus goes to the blind man. He says the same exact thing. What is it that you want me to do for me? What is it that you want me to do for you? And I thought it was really helpful. Uh, I told Richard I wasn't gonna give him credit for it, but I just did, but whatever. Um, so the, the, the reality is that was helpful because then he, he said, well, then let's just imagine for a second, Jesus is in the same clothes that we wear right now. And this is really weird for some of you to do, but I need you to hear this, this is important. He didn't just provide, he still provides. And I'm not saying in a weird, you get rich by ble- you know, seven years of blessing. I'm not, none of that trash. I'm saying Jesus is in front of you right now, right now saying, well, what do you want me to do for you? Like I, I serve. I give away. I, what is it that you want? You're worried about your kids. You're worried about your grades. You're worried about your future spouse. What do you want? What is it that you want me to do for you? And some of you have like disconnected from Jesus so much, or maybe as Tim said, because of the abundance of material goods, you don't see God as the ultimate provider. So maybe it's not food. But so many of you have been seeking satisfaction in other ways, sexual satisfaction, and satisfaction in money, satisfaction in, in, in friend groups or whatever it is, and you've realized it's just not satisfying. And Jesus all the while is in front of you going, what is it that you want me to do for you? That is real. That, that, that's, a, that's a biblical way to see Jesus. That's not blasphemous. That's real. He is that close to you. Like a brother, according to Hebrews 2. And so I think that's important. When we read this story, he didn't just provide, he provides. If we want to get real mystical, which I know as a church, we don't even know how to clap. So it's weird to like, let me just kind of hold on to my charismatic threads in the past for a second and bring us into like some biblical truth. In history, this is just true. There's a crazy story about um, St. Francis of Assisi. He uh, calls his disciples and he's walking with his disciples. Let me read this to you. It's fascinating. It comes from Claire of Assisi, who was a friend of St. Francis of Assisi. This is in uh, the early 1200s. It says, God's providence immediately came to their aid because when they're walking, walking, uh, they realize they have no food for the nights. And so she's telling the story of St. Francis of Assisi. He said, God's providence immediately came to their aid for suddenly a man carrying bread in his hand appeared, which he gave, and then suddenly disappeared. They had no idea where he had come from or where he went. Now you might be going easy, especially the cessationists in the room. Relax, okay? This is just someone else's story. I know it's crazy, right? But this is what happens. Here's what we've got here for a moment that at least based on, and this is one of thousands of accounts where God says, I'm gonna provide. I mean, catch me on a good day. You ask Candace and I, our interactions with moments where God just provided. I remember when Candace and I first just got married, um, I had almost gotten used and callous to God providing that she was like tripping out with how much God would just move. And, and I, like, I like, to my own, like, um, I, it's a default of mine. Like, it's not a great place to be. I was just like, I don't know. He's just provided cars and people. And there was this Christmas where we had negative $40 
in our bank account. And it's the classic, we only had negative 40 because we should have been negative five, but they took out the $35 charge fee. So we are at negative 40, right? So our negative 40, we have no idea what we're gonna do, how we're gonna buy groceries, how we're gonna pay rent. And I kid you not, homeboy comes up, dude comes up, hands me a check and says, God told me to give this to you. And I know that sounds for like crazy, but don't let the prosperity gospel take this biblical truth. He is here and he's asking you, what is it that you want me to do for you? What is it that you want me to do for you? He hears your prayers. That matters. He didn't just provide. He still provides. Under that banner is that first section, but then there's this other pillar, and it, it's based on the question of the fact that he still provides, and then I promise we're done. If God still provides, here's my question, how? How does he provide? And I don't think, I think it's fair to say, it's not always a random guy appearing with a check or bread. It's not always a miracle manna falling from heaven. The reality is you. And I don't know how to, like any other way to say it, but just come out right and say it. The reality is that Jesus, as you're looking and you're seeing the need, God, please provide for them. He is telling you, you feed them. You provide for them. This is a responsibility and a role that we take on as the disciples of Jesus Christ. That when there is need, it is our responsibility to enter into those spaces. As a matter of fact, um, a document called the Lausanne Covenant, it's been pretty formative for our congregation, if nothing else, because it's been formative for me. And I've uh, used that as a metric a lot of times in engaging, for example, my master's program, which is a, a MA in missional theology, like really understanding what God is doing in his great mission. And they wrote this covenant based on the fact that there's really great theological covenants out there. They're not trying to rework any of those, but they noticed that in all of this doctrine that we have, there's not a pressing into mission. So they wrote a, a covenant, the Lausanne covenant, based on the majority of it is evangelism, okay? Like our role in holding doctrines is evangelism, but they've got one chapter, chapter five in the Lausanne covenant that speaks to, and I quote, social responsibility, all right? I don't have this on the screen, so I want you just to listen to what it says. It says, when people receive Christ, they are born again into his kingdom and must seek not only to exhibit, but also to speak spread its righteousness into the midst of an unrighteous world. As, as Christians, we believe we should enter into unrighteous spaces as righteous believers. We enter into a world that is not believing. I don't think any of us would disagree with that. The salvation we claim should be transforming us in the totality of our personal and social responsibilities. And they finish with, faith without works is dead that they want to reiterate the fact that Christians for long periods of time have always taken on the responsibility of the hungry, the poor, the prisoner, the naked, the orphan, the widow. He's looking at you. He's looking at me and he's going, you take care of them. How does God provide in this very room, the resources, the effort, the energy, the time? That's how he provides. Quit looking at someone else or another church. This is why it's worth taking 20 minutes for us to go, hey, as Pella, we realize this, the global aid and the missionaries that have to be sent out, it's our responsibility to give away $70,000. It is our call that Jesus is looking at us and saying, you feed them. Uh, you know what's crazy? Fun fact, there's this um, quote, it's this long letter actually, from an emperor in Rome in the fourth century. So in the 300s, this emperor is looking at the grand scheme of what's going on with the poor in Rome, and he writes it out of anger. The tone is totally like anger driven. He's super upset because what he's seeing is not what he wants to see. This is, this is really, really cool. Uh, he, he says this because at the time, Christianity and, and the Jews are kind of melded into one. He calls Christians the Galileans and then the Jews, but, but they're together as the early churches, obviously Jew and Gentile together. He says, atheism, which is in this quote, just so you know, atheism is us. We're, we're the atheists because we're not polytheists. Atheism has uh, been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through the care for the uh, burial of the dead. It is a scandal that there's not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. That the church recognize and the emperor's recognizing Christians are not just taking care of Christians, they're taking care of everyone. And that everyone is looking to us and so here's what happens. This is, this is why people like Calvin and Geneva are building systems to go, you want to know who should take care of the poor, not the government, the church. It's the church's responsibility. And this is what the early church is doing. And this is why this emperor is upset because the church is going, they're not Bidens. They're not the governors. They're not the states. They're the churches. We enter in. And so we go, God, how do you provide? And he just simply looks back at you and he goes, you. 
I provide through you. Jesus, in this interaction, chooses to do a miracle through the disciples. Now, why he chooses to do, to do it this way is wisdom beyond us, but we know it's there. So with that being said, let me finish, because some of you are in this space right now, um, and, and I pray that like, you, you'd navigate what it looks like to be um, a provider based on God's glory and his blessing, and also recognize that, uh, yeah, he still provides for you. But on top of that, um, there's some of you who want nothing to do with God. And so let me just say this based on this text, of course, from a man, Spurgeon. He says this, Come then, weary, hungry sinner. You have nothing to do but take Christ. You have not to bake the bread or broil the fish. The bread and fish are broken, blessed, and ready. Come, taste and see. Faith to receive what Christ provides is all that is needed. This crowd does nothing. And I say the same thing to you. you, you all that is required to come to Christ is faith, and even that he gives you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to look at Matthew chapter 14. Uh, we pray, God, that you would help us navigate uh, just those three areas. One, that you'd help us navigate what it looks like to see your glory in all of it. Uh, two, we pray, God, that you'd help us navigate what it looks like to uh, see you as someone who provides for us in very real, tangible ways. And then lastly, God, I, I pray, Spirit, lead us into spaces that are of need as you're pointing to us and telling us to feed them, us to care for them, us to visit them, us to be with them. Whatever that looks like, I pray, Spirit, you'd guide us in it. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.